How many of you felt that spirit of fear the devil's trying to push? Have I sensed that? We were speaking, Amy and I, on the way here, but also the praise and worship team and I earlier regarding what's going on right now in the world. And, and you know, it almost reminds me of a little child in their toy box clearing it out angrily, just throwing things. That's what I feel like the devil is trying to do right now. Just a little angry kid trying to throw everything he can in the way of the believer to distract them, to get their thoughts, my thoughts, your thoughts, our thoughts on things that aren't of God, to get out of faith and into fear. How many of you know we can't be in both places at the same time? We can only be in one or the other. You know, we, I was talking with someone earlier, and what what was it that Job said that unlocked why things took place? The thing I have feared the most has come upon me. Fear opens the door to the enemy. So, you know, if we've been in fear at, at times, it's understandable because we live in a world where that's there's nothing but that being... being um, displays but know this perfect love casts out all fear perfect love indwells you and indwells me and so there's no fear to remain within us why because we know the end of the book we know we win so don't grow weary this has been said a lot lately don't grow weary while doing good for at due time we'll reap the harvest if Say the rest of it. If we don't faint, if we don't quit, if we don't give up. Right? Boots on the ground. Eyes on the commander. That's, that's how we have to look at it. We're soldiers in this army. We're not in it to quit. We don't need pepped up and pumped up. We've talked about that before. We're soldiers. We're here to do what God has asked us to do. And right now, that may be holding up the weight for somebody next to you, shouldering with them. Sometimes God's given us uh, opportunity in these trials to stretch and to, to look at things differently. I know this, when I went through some things with my mom and dad, I looked at some things differently. Priorities become different, right? So sometimes out of the bad, what seems bad God will always, not sometimes, he'll always use it for his good. So don't grow weary while doing good. Keep doing good. Keep after it. Amen? We learned about our emotions last week. This week we're going to talk, uh, and it'll be our final uh, series here with this book, and then whatever we don't finish tonight, please start uh, finish that on your own. Next week we will begin our new book by Kenneth Hagin, uh, Growing Up spiritually it's going to be a great book for us and you know all of these are so fitting all of these are so fitting that uh, for us to go through the past many years uh, especially the past two relating to COVID relating everything that's going on in the world we've been through Rick Renner books talking about end times we've talked about a crazy world how to live in it right out of it there's been a constant theme through all of this that God is all that we need in him we'll find everything that we need there's nothing lacking you know when my daughter was eight she said dad how do I get what God has has said that is available to me eight years old I'm thinking how do I explain this you know um, and how many of you are thankful for the Holy Spirit and it came so quickly we we're riding home from church actually and, and I said well uh, okay let's let's do it this way. If dad owns a store, and I say in that store, I put everything in there you'll ever need. I didn't leave anything out. Emotionally, spiritually, physically, everything is in there. And if you want it, when you're ready for it, you go in there and get it. And if anybody tells you you can't, the devil, you tell him, talk to my dad, because he already paid for it. And while he pays, while he's talking to, to dad, you take it and leave. And the Holy Spirit, it's so simple. It's no different for us as believers. But we can't be led by our emotions like we talked about last week. We can't be led by 
uh, you know, a spirit of fear. We can't be led by today I feel good, tomorrow I don't. Again, feelings lie to us. How many of you have opportunity this week to uh, either get into your emotion and your flesh and operate there or in the spirit? How many have had opportunity for that? How many of you won some and, and lost some? I hope we win more than we lose. That, that way we're doing good. Amen. We are going to lose some. But as we talk tonight, we need to remember chapter 10, as we go forward, Jesus is our healer. He is our healer. So he already paid for everything that we'll ever need. When he said it is finished, that meant complete. So if there's something in our life tonight that, that's hindering us, keeping us from his very best, I pray that out of it, God will reveal to us tonight uh, whatever it is that needs to be revealed so we'll be free in that area. Amen? Because healing is a part of the covenant. It's, it's part of the package. It's paid for. We may as well access it. Okay? Father, we thank you tonight for your word. Lord, I thank you that Jesus is our healer. I thank you that through him, through the blood that was shed, we have access to your very throne room. Father, we thank you tonight that your healing virtue is operating all the time. We thank you that tonight, if we've had something hinder us or keep us from that, Lord, whether it be possibly even unforgiveness, things that would be with, withholding uh, answers, Father, we, we release those people, we release those things, whatever it may be, so that we can be free to receive what you have for us tonight. Offense-free so that we can receive. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We got to be offense free before we can receive anything good. Amen. Amen. Let's look at our screens. Hebrews four. We're going to look at verse 14 again, all NLT. And it says this. So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. And 15, the high priest, this high priest of ours, understands our weaknesses for he faced all of the same testings we do yet he did not sin and 16 so let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God there we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most he says Jesus our high priest knows the feelings of our infirmities. The word of God states that Jesus knows our human weaknesses and frailties. Jesus became a man who walked upon this earth like you and me. You can look at his life and study what Paul wrote in his epistles to understand what to do with your weaknesses and frailties. Again, pointing back to that scripture, there's ans every answer we need is found in that book. That was a part of the map that would lead us somewhere if we followed that map. He goes on to say this, the word infirmities used in Hebrews 4.15 stems from the Greek word uh, that refers to feebleness of body or mind by implication, malady, moral frailty, disease, sickness, or weakness. Though infirmities or weaknesses are not sins, they can undermine our resistance to temptation. They may cause you or I to be inclined to sin, sometimes without a conscious choice on our part. This may apply to areas in which our resistance is weak. That's why Hebrews 12, 1 admonishes us to lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily, one virgin says, ensnares or tangles. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Jesus is not only touched with the fact the crippling, the weakness, the emotional hang-ups, and the inner conflicts. He's not only touched with the fact of our infirmity, but he also understands the feelings. This is important because it's, it relates Jesus' humanity, that he felt what we felt, that he endured what we endured. And so there was nothing left out there. Like I said, it was complete. It goes on to say this. He also understands the feelings, the frustrations, the anxiety, the depression, the hurts. Jesus understands the rejection and the loneliness of our infirmities. The word feeling 
comes from the Greek word meaning to feel sympathy, have compassion with, to be touched with the feeling of, or a fellow feeling. Matthew 12, 20, in referring to Jesus said, a bruised reed he shall not break, and smoking flax shall he not quench. Jesus was moved with compassion for the people and he healed them. He straightened and strengthened those who were like bruised reeds instead of breaking them off and discarding them. Aren't we thankful for that? Jesus breathed life and healing upon those whose life was like smoking flax until they were burning brightly again. Jesus cares for you as you go through this life. Let's look at Hebrews 5, uh, beginning of verse 7. While Jesus was here on earth, he offered prayers and pleadings with a loud cry and tears to the one who could rescue him from death. And God heard his prayers because of his deep reverence for God. God heard his prayers. Nothing we can experience is outside the perimeter of what Jesus experienced while he was upon this earth. Jesus experienced torment and agony in his soul in the Garden of Gethsemane. Remember, he said, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to the point of death. Judas Iscariot betrayed him, but Jesus said unto him, Judas betrayeth thou the Son of Man with a kiss. He was forsaken by all. Anybody ever feel forsaken by all? If we're not careful, we're having a pity party by ourselves. We're our biggest supporter our biggest fan. But you know, Jesus didn't have pity parties. You know what he did? He went away and prayed. He got with God. He understood that people are needy. Goes on to say this. Peter, he asked him, could you not watch with me for an hour? And the disciples, they forsook him as well and fled, Matthew 26, 56. Jesus endured false accusations and mockery at his trial. Then they spit in his face and buffeted him, and others smote him with the palm of their hands or hit him. Jesus was mocked and forsaken on the cross. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Matthew 27, 40. And in Matthew 27, 46, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Not only did Jesus suffer during his physical life, but he also was made sin for us at the cross. The cross is a major point of God identifying with man. Circle this if you have the book. This is excellent. Because of this, Jesus know how sin feels along with the guilt, the, un, the condemnation and unworthiness that comes with it. Did you ever think about that way? That he even feels the guilt, how the guilt would feel, the condemnation Remember, if it said he endured everything, every temptation, think about the temptations that we can imagine. And he had to because it wouldn't be fair if he hadn't. Otherwise, how could he say, well, I've dealt with that and I understand it. And well, no, I've never been through that. I'm God. I came down to earth as God and my God powers. But remember, it says that he set his deity aside. So when he came through, like he did for the 33 years here on earth that he was here, he was learning, he was feeling. People said mean things to him. People made accusations against him. We have to understand that the devil would love nothing more than to, for us to feel completely forsaken and alone. Because that draws us usually as human beings into a reclusive state withdrawal, it, keeping things within myself, and then I withdraw from the group. Have you ever seen anyone withdraw from a group and you knew when they were leaving, man, I don't know. But I know this, God loves everyone and God wants us to love everyone and understand even if our heart needs healed or if our body needs healed or our emotions need healed, Jesus felt it, understands it, and he is what we are in need of. Amen. 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 He was mocked and forsaken on the cross. 
Not only did Jesus suffer during his physical life, but he also was made sin for us. We read that. Let us look at uh, Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. Now, again, he has it in the New American Standard. We're going to read it in the NLT. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down easily, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. That scripture brings Forrest Gump to my mind every time. When he runs out of those leg braces, I, it, to me, I can just see it. That's what the Lord wants us to do. Get out of that stuff that's holding us back. Get them off of us. Get, get it the garbage. Discard it so we can run. Amen. Hallelujah. He says this, remember what, that whatever we're experiencing is not unfamiliar to Jesus. Let's look at the rest of that. We didn't finish that, did we? Let's look at one again. We're going to go through verse 3 there, Sherry. Hebrews 12, 1. Therefore, since we're surrounded, let us strip off. Okay, we went through that. Let's look at 2. We we're supposed to run the race God has set before us, and we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion of who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and now he is seated in the place of honor besides, beside God's throne. The important thing to remember is we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, not on what's happening. Again, we're to be aware, but we shouldn't be overcome by it. Think of all the hostility that he endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and... Anybody ever felt like giving up? But you know what? Peter said it best, didn't he? Jesus asked him, are you going to leave too? And he said what? Where am I going to go? You hold the words of eternal life. What am I going to go back to? I mean, how many of us want to go back to where we came from? It took too much to get here. So, yeah, I mean, we have to establish that in our mind, Lord, then that means that if there are things hindering me, braces on my legs that are keeping me from running, help me get them off. I know you're, you, you will do it, Lord. I know you have done it. I know I need to access it by faith. Lord, help me if I need to take a step in faith in this area. Even if it's scary and it, it gives me anxiety, I thank you for your peace that I'm not going to have anxiety in it, that you're going to lead me through it because you want me on the other side of it because there's better things from you for me. Amen. Amen. Let's look at verse 3 again. I just want to touch base with this idea one more time. Hebrews 12, 3. Think of all the hostility he endured. Have we endured what he's endured? We never will, to be honest. I saw a pastor talking about persecution in America and the church, and it's true, but it wasn't to the degree that, that he was making it out to be. When you know real persecution happening, right now people are getting their feelings hurt. No one's dying. Doesn't mean it won't get there. We've got to be wise. We have to understand sinful people are hostile towards Jesus in us. It's not us personally. It can become us personally when we take it personally. And then we make it a personal thing instead of understanding as a believer in there or not that this is not a personal thing. This is a spiritual battle. And I am to love them through this even when they're so misdirected and their ideas are so misinformed. Because I'm not going to win them over by making them my enemy in the name of God. we got to understand this so that we don't become weary mm -hmm. and give up because it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. That's why our source of happiness can't be one another. It has to be Him. We, I bring happiness to my wife and she brings happiness to my kids, but they're not my source and I'm not their source. He is. And he has to be. Let's continue on. Is it good so far? Are you getting blessed tonight? Amen. Amen. 
So Jesus tells us that remember, whatever we're experiencing isn't unfamiliar to him. He suffered far beyond the depth that any other person has or ever will suffer. However, not only did Jesus identify with mankind at Calvary through what he suffered, he in turn made it possible for a man to identify with him in his resurrection from the dead and in his victory over Satan, sin, and every other evil power. Think about that. He let us share in the good part. We didn't share in the sufferings. We share in the blessings. Now, there are times we're going to suffer because of him again, but we should never, ever retreat in the face of, of, of anyone. If God be for us, who can be against us? Let's look at Hebrews 4.14. 4, Hebrews is a, Hebrews chapter 4 would be worth you and I looking through again this week at some point, just to refresh, because there's a lot of good teaching in there. Verse 14 says this, So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold loosely, let us kind of hold on to, let us think about it when we feel like it, we will. Let us hold firmly. If I'm holding something firmly, I'm focused on it because I don't want it to get out of my grip. I've walked around. One time I was working on a property here and I had, I don't know, it was my phone or something. And I was, I think I was on the tractor and, and all of a sudden my phone's gone. There's a lot of grass out there. You know, Lord Jesus, help me. But, you know, out of it, we have to understand some things that God, even in those things, cares. Even in the small things, he cares. Sometimes we got to start trusting him there before we can see the other things. He goes on to say this in Hebrews 4, 14. So then we have this in 15. Let's look at 15. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testings we do. Yet he did not sin. In 16, so let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we'll find grace to help us when we need it most. We're not going to find his grace and receive his mercy apart from his throne room. That's where the map says I have to go to get what it says I can get. And that's what I have to do to get that and to have it. Why? Because scripture is very clear. We have to come boldly into the throne room of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We can't call so-and-so and ask them for grace and mercy in our time of need. They can't give us what they don't have. Again, just jumping off topic a little bit when relating to peace and healing and all that, the devil can't duplicate peace either. So if you have peace, it only comes from one place. It's an indicator. If I'm lacking peace, I'm not on it yet. I'm not quite dialed in yet. I got to keep praying this out. And when I get that answer, Donna was saying earlier, she had a decision with work and it was uh, had to be a rapid decision somewhat and, and she needed some real wisdom really quick. And she prayed and, and felt like she got it and within hours that decision was made and it was for her good. And she said herself, I felt peace over it. So I knew it was the right thing. That's all that, that we need. That's it. Let's go on. When Jesus endured at the cross, what he endured at the cross, we did not have to bear. The work of redemption was a vicarious work. Jesus did it for others, not for himself. Therefore, we can identify with Christ in the victory he obtained and apply it to our lives. Did Jesus endure the cross? Did Jesus finish his work in spite of all the suffering that he went through? Did Jesus defeat the devil, death, and the grave rising up in his glory to ascend to the right hand of the Father? The answer to all of these is a big yes, he did. How then can we apply the victory of Jesus in our life? Number one, circle this, continually confess with your mouth what Jesus did for you at Calvary. Confess what he's done. Two, confess who you are in him, who I am in him. We have to do that. We can't do that if we don't know. 
We have to read to know. And three, we have to confess what the word of God has promised us. Continually confessing or speaking what the word of God says in these three areas can help more, will help more than almost anything else we can do. Underline this as well. Confess what God has said in his word rather than our failures, feelings, or experiences. Confess what God said in his word. Well, I know that's what it said, but, but, or if, what's the old saying? If, uh, if ands and buts were candy and nuts, we'd all have a great Christmas. <laughs> you know, that whole idea, people want to, sometimes believers especially want to add a but or an if to the word of God. No. Unless we're saying, but God. When the enemy comes in like a flood. So for, for the believer, again, Jesus endured what we have to bear, and he, he understands what we're dealing with, but to apply it, we have to begin confessing it. We can't just think it. Our words have power. When we release that word, it's on target to its destination, whatever it may be, good or bad. Imagine it as an arrow. Once it's left, we can't retract it. All we can do is be responsible for where it lands, and hopefully it lands where it's supposed to and not where it's not. But in the word of God, as we're applying things and confessing things with our mouth, confessing who we are in Jesus, what he did for us, what's that going to do? It's going to stir up our heart. It's going to stir up the faith. It's going to remind us of who he is and what he's done before. And if he did it before, then he can do it again. Amen. So if he healed me before, he can heal me again. Right? How many of you have ever been a recipient of something from God when you really weren't living for him, but you got something good from him anyway? Raise your hand if that's you. But looking back, I don't think I've ever gotten anything because I deserved it. And the stuff I deserve, he's not wanting to give me. Remember, he didn't create hell for us. He created hell for the devil. And so we have to be mindful as we go through things in life. The devil is going to get us into a place of doubt. If he can get us doubting and starting to question God, where does that end? It can be something so simple as, I wonder how the 5,000 people, like, how did they hear? How did, you know, how did that, anybody ever been there? Something so simple. And you just, well, I wonder in the natural way. But where does that end? Faith isn't questioning. It's believing. Then the questions are answered. We have to believe first. Does that make sense? And it's not based on our feeling. It's not based on our goodness. Do we deserve it or not? No. The hands are simple. None of us do, right? But his unmerited favor and his great grace. Thank God for that. And that's because of the work that Jesus did. So as we confess that and speak that up out of us, what's going to happen? As we confess that, what the word of God says, it'll help us more than anything else. Because as we confess what God has said in his word rather than our failures, we're going to magnify the solution instead of the problem. What are we saying? What are we believing? Are we believing one thing and saying another? God has given us every answer that we need. And again, you know, as we look into this and as we confess his, his faith over the, our faith over the fact, again, he created everything within this world, including what a fact is. Right? So he has authority over the fact. Am, am I right or wrong? Yes. So then it's true in my life or no? If I apply it, if I believe it, if I speak it, it is true for each and every one of us. 
Because, you know, he wants us to be confessing. He wants us reminded. Why? Because he wants us to always know that we know that we know that he's a good, good father. He's not a bad dad, a father of death and disease. God doesn't take people from this earth. He receives them. The devil takes people. I'm convinced that if we could just, this is the bottom of page 72, if we could just get people to say what the word of God says about them, rather than just talking about their problems, many of the problems would be solved. Circle this, identify yourself with Christ rather than with your problems. Who are you or who you are? And what you have in Christ is greater than any problem you're going to go through. There are many scriptures, especially in the letters written by the Apostle Paul that tell you who you are in Christ. This is your real identity as a Christian. For example, 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us, Therefore, if any man be or woman in Christ, they are a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That seems to me like a scripture that took all of my excuses away for doing what I want to do and saying, but I'm still learning. I'm still in my flesh. You know, I'm still going to deal with this. Sorry, God. I'm not going to change it probably, but sorry. Come on. We're talking about the author of life. For us to have that mindset and to think, Lord, you are the solution, never the problem. When we begin disagreeing with God and what he said in his word, it's not God that is the problem. So we have to be very careful that, one, we know his word so we confess, can confess his word. For example, I'm the head and not the tail, right? I'm blessed. We talked about this before and highly favored. Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13, my favorite scripture. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you the future that you hope for, the message version says. Well, if I hope for it and he's going to give it to me, then that means that I'm hoping for his will anyway. Right? So as we hope for Psalm 37, 4, serve the Lord with all your heart. He'll give you the desires of your heart. But there's a qualifier. Then you'll come and seek me. And you'll find me when you seek me with all your heart. There's always a map. There's always a location. There's always a way. But we have to not only follow the map and say, yes, I saw it and I, 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 I believe it. But we have to act on it. We have to apply it to our everyday living. So tomorrow, what I want us to do when we wake up or even tonight before we go to bed, I want us confessing some good things that the Lord has been doing in our life. Confessing some good things. I'm not saying being un, uh, unaware and that, again, we, we ignore things. But remember, no matter what the fact is that you or I may be dealing with, he is greater than that fact because he created fact. So as we understand what we're dealing with, okay, Lord, I need to apply more of your word. That's always the medication. That's always the fix. I'm going to apply more of your word. I'm going to spend more time in your presence. Why? So that I hear less of everything else and more of you, and I'll have less of all the bad and more of your good. It seems simple, doesn't it? Is it? He, he really made it as simple as he could. We just got to take him at his word. You know, one of my pet peeves is if I say something and then someone, well, did you really mean that? If I said it, now, sometimes I shouldn't have said it. And yes, I meant it, and I'm sorry. God said it. He means it. He means it. So tonight, if you've, you know, struggled in, in the last couple months with everything going on, we understand. You know, we're, we're not, we're human as well. We're, we're, I know this from the top down, trying to act as wisely and be as wise as we can as we go through this time. I've been pastoring 20 years full time and pastor 30. And I, I will tell you, and he would say the same thing. It is a difficult time to be a pastor and to, to lead. And, and, and I know the heart is to lead wisely and in love and to make sure that we are all growing safely together. 
So be in prayer for, for the church body. Be in prayer for your, your families, for your friends. But speak things over yourself. Begin to speak the goodness of God over your life. Begin to speak that you're debt free and, and make a plan to get debt free. Begin to speak that you're healed and make a plan to, to get on that path. And it may start with changing a diet or, or working some exercise in or who knows. Whatever the Holy Spirit leads you to do, just if we would just do it, our life would be so much better and so much easier and we'd have so much more fun. So let's, ta let's take him at his, his word this week. Let's thank him for the things that we have that we know he's blessed us with and thank him for the things that we know he's going to bless us with we haven't seen yet. Speak those things out. Speak those things out. Sometimes it's years. Don't grow weary. The Holy Spirit keeps bringing that back to my mind. Don't grow weary on doing good. For in due time, or at the right time, you'll reap, I'll reap the harvest our families, our friends, if we don't give up. Amen. We're stronger together. Court of three strands. There's a lot more than three of us in here. Amen. Amen. We're going to receive offering tonight, and then we'll take some prayer requests. They're going to get us off camera here. I have a couple here I saw.